Hello and welcome to uh, an On Your Todd talk. Uh, my name's Ruth Miller, I'm the founder of the London Mural Preservation Society and I'm here today to talk to you about community murals in London between the 1970s and 1980s. Um, around this period, I like to sort of think approximately 1975 through to about 1988, there's about 350 to 400 murals that were created by local artists in um, London and um, often in areas that we like to call uh, deprived inner city areas and also in bits of the suburb like Greenwich and Woolwich but generally yeah it's it's Hackney it's Brixton and um, community murals are really interesting because um, they have their roots they share a root with the abstract art um, so back in the 60s you have art becoming very much a commodity, you've got pop art, it's very commercial, it's like how much do we sell or buy this for Andy Warhol and his paintings and screen prints and all the rest of it and there's a backlash and that backlash out of it becomes abstract art where people are like here's a slash on the paper and no one, no one would want that. Through to community murals where you remove the idea of the lone genius where everybody's brush stroke is on it, everybody's ideas are in there, you know whose idea is it? Um, so that's that's part of the roots of community murals, um, but there was already a, quite a big movement that was happening in the late 60s and 70s in America. Um, over here, we've got the earliest group, or one of the early groups that I know of, is the Fireheart Squad, who seems to be working in the um, earliest parts of the 70s. But I often think that um, the sort of early the mural movement in London starts very much with Greenwich Mural Workshop. When Carol travels over, um, it's Carol Kenner's one of the uh, founders, she travels over to America to do some studies on planning and sees murals and comes back to London um, and to her partner Stephen Lobb and says, we need to be painting murals in the community. Um, one of the important things about community murals is that you are working with local people and you are engaging with them, you're getting them on board. Um, and the other thing, as I said, talked about, you don't have the lone genius because everybody should be part of the process, whether it's about their being part of the creation, whether it's about their ideas are in it or their designs are in it or whether they help paint or whether their portraits are in it. This is, this is a really important part of these movements. So the example um, that I like to look at um, is the Floyd Road mural. And this is done in 1976 by Greenwich Mural Workshop. Um, it's still there. And uh, it's a really nice example of a community mural. Um, the, the subject in it, it's about the people of the streets where it's... Um, where it's made and they are working together on their houses to repair them and they're fighting against the developers so you've got all these diggers in the pictures coming in and trying to take over um, trying to and the people are there going no and they're together and there's a few things that are great about this apart from it's a beautiful composition but it also it um, features all sorts of different people it, it celebrates the diversity of the community. You've got old, young, black, white, brown, um, abled or disabled. It's, it's really inclusive and that's really important that our community the, and, and the community is not just seen as one type of people. But it's also the working together. That's another powerful message. But the other thing that is, it happens at this time is that you have... Um, members of the local community being asked about their mural and they're asked to help paint it and so they come and they do this painting um, with Carol and Stephen and then they're not only that but they are also portrayed in the mural so this is massively different from any paintings before and we're talking about often these are in areas where we've got groups of people who probably haven't been into an art gallery or art galleries maybe something they went through with school I mean we have to talk we're back in the 70s, so we've only got the Tate at Pimlico at that point and the National Gallery. And these are spaces that would have taken a bit of money to get into town. They're not necessarily as accessible as open. So imagine you go down your road, you go past this massive piece of art. And in the art is a subject matter that you can understand. There's your local community or a community and they're working on their houses and they're trying to stop that community being destroyed. 
But also, when you look at the picture, you see your friends. And when you talk to your friends, they say, oh yes, I helped paint that. I had a paintbrush, I did that bit and that bit. There's this massive, massive sense of empowerment and ownership um, and, and agency, particularly when people are being asked about what they want to see on the walls. Um, so this is, this is really amazing because this is ordinary people on the street being able to see themselves in art in a public space. And I don't know if this has happened before that point, um, so that's, that's something really important. This is 1976, this is where this is starting to happen. But also at the other point, at the other end of um, what comes under the banner of community murals, um, we've got a, a bit of a different beast that happens here. So there's something political in these murals about the community coming together and fighting and pushing against. But um, these murals also turn up in 1977. And this uh, one at the top is done by Des Rochford and the one at the bottom is done by Dave Binnington and they work together, they get funding um, and they basically create these massive murals very much in the style of the Mexican mural movement and they create these pieces in a paint called Kime which has a longevity so they're thinking about how long are these pieces going to be here they want to create art that's staying there but the other thing that they're creating is art that, that, that you can read so you can look at these pictures and you can kind of go, well, I like the colours. That's a really nice palette. Um, I like that blue. I'd have it in my house. You can see the pictures. You can go, ah, oh, this is all about workers and work, isn't this? And is this about oppression or is this about celebrating work? I don't know, but it's easy for people to read. That's really important too. This is something in a public space, so it doesn't want to be alien. But there's also a very considered piece of fine art going on here. And so in some ways, this, this is a something slightly different. This is also pushing through at this time. And the next piece that um, Dave Binnington goes on to do seems to start to mix the two processes. So the next piece of work that Dave Binnington is, is asked to work on is at Cable Street. Now, he basically um, gets his commission to paint on this massive wall. And it's probably one of the, well, it's like three very big walls in London and, and those two at Royal Oak are two of the biggest sort of areas to have been painted on. So um, Dave's been given this commission so he goes out and he speaks to people in the Cable Street area about the experience about the Battle of Cable Street. This happened in 1936. Um, it's basically when the local community stopped the fascists on Oswald Mosley walking down Cable Street, it, which was a particularly Jewish area. But lots of different groups of community came out and stopped this. And again, you can hear this theme, can't you? This is about community coming together and fighting and standing there and being strong. And that, that you know, this is really exciting messages coming through in the, in the 70s in these artworks. So one of the things Dave does is he talks to local people. He talks to people who are there and he creates a piece and an outline. Um, and I don't have, I don't ha I do have somewhere a version of what he did. Uh, but the Cable Street mural seems to hit, this is its final version, it hits lots of different problems. Um, initially when it's getting close to completion, it's taken a really long time. Um, what happens to it is it gets heavily vandalised and Dave decides that he can't work on it anymore. And so we get three other artists come through, his friend Des Rochford, Paul Butler and Ray Walker and they all help redesign bits of the mural and complete it. It's an amazing piece. Please go and see it. It's, you go to Shadwell, you know, ask where the massive mural is. It's worth, it really is worth having a look. And, you know, these, these pieces of artwork are really important because you can read them. You can look at them. You can see what's happening. You can ask the questions. What is this about? Um, it's, it's putting, it is plonking messages where advertisement usually takes its place. If this had never been done, would there have been a big advert for, you know, some booze or cigarettes? Who knows? But this is there, and it's been repaired by Paul Butler, so it's in really good condition, and yes, please go and see it. So, these are, these are sort of three really important murals. This is also painted in Kime again, and you can sort of see that we've got this kind of talking to the community going on. Um, we've got murals that are talking about power in the community. So behind me, I've got a mural that we need to talk about, uh, which is the wonderful Nuclear Dawn, which is in Brixton. It's still there, it's very faded. This is it back in its prime in the 1980s. 
um, and it's painted by Brian uh, Barnes and Dale McCree and uh, Dale lived at Carlton Mansions at that period and um, he offered Brian this great big wall and they worked a little bit with the community at Carlton Mansions to create this massive piece. It is amazing, it's really important for me, I think it's a really important piece because it talks about um, the threat of nuclear war that was happening at this time or certainly the threat of the bomb being dropped and how that was such a big part of the dialogue going on in London at that time it's very easy to forget now because it seems so far away but we're, this is, we're coming into the time of Green and Common when we look at this piece of art so um, this piece he did it was, again this is a, uh, Brian did lots of other pieces before that there's a piece called Morgan's Wall that he did um, in the 1970s, again, that that pretty much um, you know is a really great symbol of of again community murals. It features stuff about local politics. It it features um, local community members. It features uh, local scenes. There's the bus on it. There's all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, sadly, it got destroyed in the 70s, um, so it's no longer with us. But there's lots of uh, bits of information about it still around. Um, so yeah, Brian is another person who's done lots and lots of different pieces within the community and often worked with listening to what um, people are wanting to put on the wall. Uh, another artist working around that time is Christine Thomas. I've chatted to her before about her pieces and um, it's very interesting. Um, she talked to me about the big splash in Brixton, which is a really lovely piece she did with the community. And again, she, um, reached out to local people she said she knocked on every door to ask them what they wanted on their mural what do you want to see and so the deciding finished piece is about the river Ephra and it has local children playing in the water and it has the potters at Dalton um, who the ladies potters so there's something very much about celebrating women in art uh, this is another really important thing that comes out of these period of uh, mural workers is that there are a lot of women involved um, so of the pieces that are around, approximately about 45% of them are done by women or have women involved. And also we have women's only uh, groups turning up like London Wall. Uh, London Wall are a really interesting group because they turn up um, having done a tr work training scheme. Um, I think it, this one was through Manpower. Manpower seems to be the place where you could go and train with a muralist to do murals. So they, um, with a group called Brass Tax, um, they do some training and they do some pieces and eventually they set up as their own uh, as the London Wall and so there's four women involved and uh, again their methods of um, work are really interesting they talk to the community what would you like to see what sort of themes you see but with their artworks they design um, they work with collage pieces um, certainly the two pieces in Brixton are done this way so the women um, instead of it being one brush stroke or everybody's Variant, various drawings, what they do is they create different collage pieces and put them down until they came up with an agreed design. So it's a really different way of working, but again, there is community involvement at some point. And um, in both cases, with Christine, who I mentioned, and with London Wall, is they paint their own murals, but there are other cases, um, like the Windmore mural that happened in Brixton, as we know that the artists there had the local kids out helping paint it. So again, we've got this community involvement on different levels. Um, Sarah Faulkner and Gordon Wilkinson, they talked about um, their paintings had lots of portraits of local people in. And they talked about sometimes the people weren't happy with the portraits and um, <laughs> they'd go in and adjust them a little bit and until the person said, yeah, that looks like me. And what's amazing is at this time in the 70s and 80s and in areas that were deprived, the, um, that were poor, that were run down. You had these big pictures going up on the wall, sometimes three, four storey high pictures of local community where you might see your face or your friends' faces on the wall. And yes, you might be stuck there for 30 years wearing some really bad 80s outfit, but hey, there was something incredibly empowering about having a choice about what's on your wall, being able to see yourself and what exists in your life on your wall, instead of your life's being ignored and pushed aside, and instead of art just only existing in galleries. So, and it's not just about that sense of empowerment in the community and strong messages about what community means, but it also means that people are being exposed to art. So when you go through Brixton, 
as I did as a child, you could see pieces and you go, I like that, I don't like that, that's a bit boring. That's really funny, that's my friend. You had a dialogue about it, you would have an opinion. That's really great, particularly if nobody's ever going to art galleries. So who else do they have to talk about? This is the thing, so as I said, the murals have a time frame where they exist. And so they, they basically are going from, let's say about 1970s, and they finish around the 1980s. Why do they finish? One of the big things that happens is um, the GLC ends. Now the GLC is the Greater London Council. At this point it's being run by Ken Livingstone and in uh, 87, 88 it gets shut. End of that, no funding. And lots of these murals get funding from there. Another big change is in the Art Council. The Art Council has a, a massive uh, community arts pot, that goes all around the same time. So these organisations that are either starting up out from their manpower groups, out from this training scheme, they suddenly there's not any money. Those who are established have to find different ways to get money um, and find different ways of doing things. Uh, there's an organisation called Freeform Art. Now they had already been doing lots of different things like festivals, screen t-shirt screen printing. Um, they had lots of different methods of community outreach. So they have the ability uh, to be flexible and adaptable. They started to do more work in um, mosaics, they started doing work on hoardings. Um, so in central London there might be massive panels around a site that's being developed which they would have worked on. Um, I think there's some stuff in a subway that they actually did that's still there from the 80s. So they knew how to move on. Greenwich Mill Workshop moved into um, more mosaics and you can see a whole batch they did uh, about Hitchcock in Leytonstone. People moved on, and for others, if you, you weren't adaptable, you didn't, and you didn't survive, or you, you know, the work dried up. So, what else do I need to say? So, yeah, so we've basically got this movement, 300 odd murals. I'd say there's probably about, maybe about 40 odd left from this time. You find bits of them, you find remnants. You might find that there's one still there that's hidden somewhere. There are, they are out there. Dalston, um, mural at Dalston, um, the Cable Street mural, they've both been repaired. Um, there are some in Brixton. Um, what's really exciting is that, that on the underground at the moment in Brixton, they've got a project about murals in the community, um, where they've done a big mural as you enter in. It, they've got this six month sort of rolling program of new artworks and they're about community and they're about local people. And they come out of this whole story around the murals in Brixton and community murals in London. So that's really nice, we kind of come full circle where a, a, a contemporary project is really influenced by the murals of the past and is delivering again murals that are about community and about local people. So I think I'm going to finish there <laughs> because <laughs> that's a lot to take in. There's so much more to talk about, um, lots of different aspects here. If you want to find out more, um, there's the London Mural Preservation Society website, you can check that out. Otherwise, Google murals in London, that people are writing about community murals all the time. It's a growing interest, and particularly with um, uh, street art about and people asking questions. Okay, hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Bye.